Hello and welcome to another podcast for National Inset Week 2014 and today I'm joined by Simon Leather. He is the head of the applied suite of master's courses at Harper Adams University. He's worked for a long time in forest pest ecology and agricultural pest ecology. He's also a keen promoter of entomology through social media and elsewhere. So Simon, thanks for joining me today. All right. Hi, Chris. Uh, good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, this is actually the second time we're trying this interview, <laughs> yeah. so uh, let's hope it goes smoothly this time. Um, you're well known for your love of insects, obviously, and in particular, aphids. So how did you get into studying insects, and why did aphids grab you in particular? Okay, so I was actually uh, really lucky. I was brought up in uh, the tropics and spent uh, the time from when I was five till ten in Jamaica, which is really full of fantastic insects. Uh, And at the time, I was really into ants and termites. I was a real social insect sort of person, and that sort of stuck with me. And um, when I eventually ended up at um, University at Leeds, I was doing a course called Agricultural Zoology, which was basically invert zoo, uh, so uh, entomology and parasitology with an applied uh, aspect. And I was still very much into the social insects. And in my second year, uh, we had a lecture by uh, a guy called Noel Gibson, who sadly died many years ago. Uh, and he gave us this lecture on aphids, uh, in particular life cycles. And I remember going, wow, these things are so complicated. And they've got these fantastic names for all these different morphs. And that was it. I became an aphid person. And uh, I've never looked back. So that's uh, 40 years of being interested in aphids. And I still like ants, of course. Yeah. So... With this kind of thing, this is your main area of research, mm. really, aphids. You do study a diverse range yeah. of insects and situations. Yeah. But over your career, what's been your favourite research highlights okay. where you've really enjoyed what you've done? Uh... Right, well, I guess the, the sort of the thing I'm really most proud of, I guess, is that um, uh, way back at the start of uh, my my professional entomological career when I was doing my PhD on the bird cherry aphid, uh, Rapala pedi, if you want its correct name. Um, and when I was doing my PhD, I was sort of one of these mugs who was interested in every stage of the life cycle. And I sort of did my thesis on every morph from egg through back to the things. And so I did a lot of overwintering work counting uh, aphid eggs. And my first postdoc Uh, was in Finland, which has quite nice winters. Um, And one of the things I had to do was come up with a replacement forecasting scheme for the bird cherry aphid in Finland. And I based this, um, because I'd been doing all the work on the aphid eggs, I sort of thought, well, why don't we use the aphid eggs to predict what's going to happen in the spring and the summer so that the farmers have lots of advance warning. Uh, So I came up with a forecasting scheme uh, using these eggs and that is to this day is the system they use in Finland so you know that's what you know international national impact it's it's great so this is one thing you see with um, especially applied research in entomology you're doing research that really does get picked up by by people and is used yeah I mean that's one of the things I mean I sort of went into research because I wanted to do something that I thought was useful. Um, I mean, I like doing pure research, you know, just curiosity-driven research. So, for example, recently uh, we had a paper out looking at pea aphids eating each other, you know, cannibalism (laughs) in the pea aphid, which, of course, has no... Well, not that I can see. It may may have some (laughs) applied relevance. Um, It certainly caused a a lot of publicity. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, um, so I, I like the pure stuff as much as the apply stuff i'm just really curious about how they work and you know not just aphids of course that's really Mm. interesting just looking at uh, all the wonderful wonderful things that insects are doing out there so i also do urban ecology so i spent 12 years working on bracknell roundabouts for example and um looking at how bracknell forest borough council could manage their roundabouts in a more ecologically beneficial way and they they you know they have taken some notice and the way they manage their roundabouts and their verges is different than they used to you know 15 years ago and the sort of things that we were bringing up on these roundabouts are 
you know now things that other councils do and we, there's been teleprograms about people trying to introduce more native flowers to verges in Harrogate for example so you know so that sort of stuff's had an impact as well so so roundabouts really can have a, a, a beneficial source yeah um, I mean on the roundabouts in Bracknell for example we found um, notable insects I mean found also common insects as well but we found things that are uh, uncommon rare uh, we haven't got any red didn't find any red data book species but we have certainly found things that are uncommon we found things that you would normally find on moorlands and they're just living on sort of a patch of heather and a scots pine <laughs> tree on, on one of the bigger roundabouts we found uh invasive bugs you know it's 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 all sorts of really interesting things happening on the roundabouts so they've uh, really got conservation value in your urban landscapes. Roundabouts can really yeah, boost biodiversity um, in these. Oh yeah, I mean the roundabouts. If you plant the right things on them, they can be fantastic. The more native species of trees you have on there, the more bugs you get, and then that's better for the birds. So, mm-hmm. uh, oops, I've talked about vertebrates, <laughs> uh, but yes, I have done some work on vertebrates as well. <laughs> but mainly, it's all to do with insects. That's good. Uh, back back to the <laughs> yeah. back to the main ones. Yeah. So you're also known for your passionate promotion of entomology. You lead this suite of applied courses at Harper Adams University. So your forestry, your integrated pest management, your entomology. Where do you see the future of entomology going? Do you, do you see that there's been an increased um, interest from a younger generation in taking these kind of courses in the recent years? Yeah, OK. So, I mean, well, it's one, one of the reasons um, I moved to Harper Adams University away from Imperial College was because Harper has much better facilities for this sort of area of work and promotion of entomology. And I think one of the really worrying things I've seen over the last few years is that things like, not just entomology, but things like plant pathology and nematology are sort of becoming lost sciences. And yet they are the very bedrock of food security and biodiversity. If we don't understand uh, plant pathology, we don't... I mean, nematodes are hugely important, and people, uh, there's hardly anybody studies them. Uh, but looking at plant parasitic nematodes, looking at uh, other insects apart from butterflies and, things, and dragonflies, um, there's been a huge lack of teaching of these subjects in universities over uh, the last 30, 40 years. I mean, when I went to... Um, at university as an undergraduate, a zoology degree had a huge amount of invertebrate zoology in it. Nowadays, zoology degrees hardly mention invertebrates. Some zoology degrees, you know, they sort of just skim it. Uh, you know, maybe 12 lectures in the whole of their, their three years. And when you consider that invertebrates and insects are the great majority of zoology, and the vertebrates are sort of non-significant in terms of their proportion of species it, it's really worrying and uh what i'm really pleased about is um is since i've been on twitter uh i've seen that there's actually a lot of people who are interested in entomology and i think the really important thing we've got to do is get this interest in entomology recognized by the higher education in, uh, institutes and by schools uh, to get the syllabuses changed, get people to realise how important invertebrates and insects are, uh, so that we get more people, young people, wanting to study invertebrates rather than wanting to to play with giraffes and lions and things like this. And you know, just actually think where is the bi- where is the diversity? What is actually important? And I think that's uh, sort of ties in with uh, National Insect Week this year, which is you know the little things that run the world. Uh, and yeah, I mean. It, it's been very encouraging that um, my MSc course in entomology continues to attract uh, a large number of highly um, talented and intelligent people of all ages, I have to say, not just the young, but we get people sort of in their 30s and 40s who decided, right, we want to study entomology. This is where we should have gone in the first place. So I'm hopeful and confident that entomology as a discipline, may be taught not just at Harper Adams, but may be taught at other universities, and perhaps we'll see the return of undergraduate entomology degrees. Um, And certainly, I think the funding bodies are beginning to realise that we do need to understand whole organism entomology uh, and actually know what's out there. So what exciting things can you see for the future, perhaps in your research or, or, or with people that you work with? Can you see some exciting horizons for entomology? Yeah, well, I think um, if we think about the applied 
uh, end of things. I mean, it's, it, it exists already, that field, but I can see it really taking off in a big way when people having to really get to grips with knowing what the insects are doing at a, at a, a much more precise scale. So, for example, Tom Pope, one of my colleagues, who incidentally did do the MSc uh, in applied entomology many years ago, and I taught him, um, he's, he uses radio trackers on... Um, on these um, weevils to see where they actually go and uses their behavior to then work out how can we use their natural uh, fungal diseases to help you know them distribute it themselves uh, around the the glass houses and things like that and that's the sort of thing I think is going to be really important and we've got um, that's my cat <laughs> <laughs> we've got a bird, we're inter interrupting our invertebrate talk <laughs> Hi, Colin. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to... Uh, yeah, uh, so with the microbials. Um, and I think it's making people think a lot more about other ways. So, for example, Ger Geraldine Wright at Newcastle University uh, just this uh, last couple of weeks has pr produced a paper talking about using um, uh, spider venom and snowdrop lectins as an alternative method of controlling uh, pests on things like oilseed rape. And the newspapers, of course, have got hold of this story and say, this is now no need for neonicotinoids. We can use this very safe um, new pesticide. Of course, what they haven't, I guess, grasped is it's going to take many years before this will become a commercial product. But that's the sort of thing that people are going to have to start thinking about. Really ingenious ways of bringing these, you know, high, high tech, high science, ecologically based uh, methods of controlling uh, our insect pests and our other pests as well so i mean it's it's a real um a multidisciplinary effort you know you you have to talk to engineers you have to talk to uh chemists um you know it's ecologists economists even because of course you've got to decide you know what is where is it economical for the farmer or the grower to spray or not to spray and how much loss can you tolerate how how quickly this the, the control method might work so i mean that's it's what i i really like about um sort of applied entomology is this sort of uh, puzzle solving I guess is the, thing. the final question what is your most memorable your favourite insect encounter <coughs> gosh um, I think I've got more than one <laughs> um, <laughs> so I mean some of the things I guess things that sort of tickle your fancy so for example um, I have the most northerly record of the um, snow flea Boreas himalis, which is a macopteran, so it's not even an aphid, and I came across that one winter um, up in the uh, north of Scotland. I was setting out a field plot uh, in January, I think, so the snow was pretty deep in the forest. I couldn't drive my vehicle in, so I'd had to trek in 10 kilometres into to my field site, and it was one of these hot, well, not hot, but a sunny <laughs> blue sky day in northern Scotland with snow on the ground, and I started seeing all these spots jumping up and down on the snow sort of in the distance and I thought I was going snow blind or something and then when I got there there were all these strange looking insects bobbing up and down on the snow and I thought gosh what is the, these I collected them and it turned out they were snow fleas and that was the furthest north record at the time so I have a dot on the map furthest north of uh, Boreas Himalis hmm. uh, and I guess I also have the furthest north record of um, the corn leaf aphid when I was working in Finland doing field work I came across the Palisipha Madis that had never been found there before so that was uh, so you get these it's a bit like I guess how bird people like to get on badges their, of honour yeah so that those sorts of things are good um, and my sort of most intriguing two two things that I really would like to know the answer to um, there's a, <clears throat> a an aphid called the large willow aphid or the giant willow aphid which is possibly the biggest aphid in the world and I've had two PhD students working on that uh, in over the years and it's got two things that we don't know about still it has a shark's fin on its back uh, which you can actually pick it up by. Um, I mean, some people say it's like a rose thorn, but I always like to call it the shark fin daphid, uh, which I've blogged about in the past. And we don't know why it's got this tubercle, which is the right name for it. So it's got this fin on its back. What's it for? We don't know. And we also don't know where it goes in the winter. So most aphids sort of um, shut up shop round about September, October, and they either lay eggs or sort of hang on desperately uh, to get through the winter months. Uh, 
tubercular, the giant willow aphid tuber, tuberolacnus salignus, to give it its real name, uh, carries on feeding till about February. It doesn't feed on the leaves, feeds on the stem, and then it disappears. And then you don't see it again until sort of June, July time. And we don't know what it does. <laughs> uh, so, you know, two, two great unsolved mysteries for somebody. So thank you very much, Simon, for joining us today. And make sure to follow Simon at, on Twitter at EntoProf yeah. and also your blog. Yeah, uh, don't forget the roundabouts. Uh, follow this. Yeah, very important. <laughs> and so thank you very much. All right, thanks, Chris.